Okay, we've had uh, three lectures on thermodynamics and we've learned quite a lot of material and we are already in a position to apply that knowledge for a real industrial problem. Okay, so you might be surprised that just after three lectures on thermodynamics, we can actually apply this to a real industrial problem. And the problem that I'm going to talk about uh, is mechanical alloying. This is a process by which we make an alloy, in other words, a, a solution, by taking elemental powders and bashing them together in the solid state. Okay, so there's no melting involved in this process. We take large lumps of material, you hit them together so often that they become intimately mixed into an atomic solution. Now, why would you want to do that? Why not simply melt the constituents together? You won't be uh, using much of uh, I mean, there is a case there. I don't know whether we are saving or using excess energy. Obviously, it's a different amount of energy. But that isn't the main issue. Okay. So now, because of the microstructure, we are able to get. Okay. Exactly. You want okay. control, and then later on, probably uh, one can go for annealing and other kind of thing, bleeding process. First mixing and then bleaching. Yes, yes. Now, let me ask the question in a different way. Uh, supposing I wanted incredibly sweet tea, okay. would it help if I simply poured a huge amount of sugar? Because at some point it will stop dissolving, wouldn't it? So no matter how much sugar I add into it, it won't actually get sweeter, right? But I want it even sweeter than that. Yeah, I want to force in more sugar than can actually dissolve according to equilibrium. So using a process like this, I can force, for example, a lot more aluminium into iron than would happen if I had aluminium being put into liquid iron. Okay, so you can create materials which are incredible. You know, they, they would not happen if you made them by melting. Uh, at the same time, you have the possibility of throwing in particles which will not dissolve. Now, the advantage of that is that you could actually create a very fine dispersion of inert particles which will resist def deformation at high temperatures. So, one of the commercial materials that's produced is an iron-based alloy, where you take iron powder, titanium powder, aluminium powder, and yttrium oxide. Now, yttrium oxide is an extremely stable oxide. So, once you introduce it in the material, it will stay exactly as you introduced it. No matter how high the temperature, even 1400 degrees centigrade. And you couldn't introduce it by precipitation because you have to add yttrium to the liquid and it simply oxidizes and disappears into the slag. So we take these powders, we put them into a cylinder which contains cast iron balls. And when the cylinder rotates, the balls impact against the powder and then they weld the powders together, break them up, weld them up so many times that eventually you end up with an atomic solid solution. And I'll show you the proof that we end up with an atomic solid solution in a short while. Of course, this is still a powder. It's called a mechanically alloyed powder. You then need to consolidate it. That means make it into a solid lump which you're going to use. So what you do is you extrude it just like plasticine, this is a very impressive process. You know, you're taking metal and you're basically putting huge forces and joining up all the particles in the solid state, and then you might give it some kind of heat treatment to get exactly the right properties that you want. But you have a huge amount of possibilities which don't exist if you try to make a material simply by melting the elements together. Okay? So this is the process that we are going to tackle. Uh, we have instruments where you can see individual atoms. First of all, we, we need to understand the process and prove that we are actually forming a solid solution. So, uh, an instrument called an atom probe, in which you take a sample which is like a needle, and it's atomically sharp. Then put a very large electrical field on the tip, and the lines of force basically are followed by ions, which then impact onto a luminescent screen, 
and you get an image like this, which where each dot is an individual atom. Uh, so it's a magnification of the order of 10 million times. It's called an atom probe. Now you see this dark object in the middle. That's a hole in the screen. And the ions can carry on through that into a time of flight mass spectrometer, which basically measures the time taken for atoms to fly between two points. And from that, you can get the chemical analysis of individual atoms. Okay. So you not only get spatial resolution, which is atomic, but also chemical information, which is atomic. So if I wanted to determine whether this is a solid solution, all I need to do is get a, pull out a stream of atoms and measure their chemical compositions and see if I get large clusters of chromium iron instead of a nice mixture of chromium and iron in the sequence. Yeah. And here is such a sequence. And I plotted this graph in, in 50 clusters of 50 ions, because if I didn't do that, if I plotted just one at a time, then I would have 100% chromium, 100% iron, 100% chromium, would be very interesting to see. Okay. So this is, each point here is an averaged value over 50 ions. Now the question is, is this a solid solution or not? I mean, is this homogeneous? That's another way of asking the question. How can I decide, you know, whether this is homogeneous or not? Because look, uh, if, I, if I just observe this, I can get variation from 60 to 80 percent of iron. Should that worry me? It's a very difficult question, actually, because as I said, if I just pick out one at a, at a time, then I would have a variation from 100 to 100, zero. What we have to do is decide whether in a completely random solution, if I picked up 50 atom groups, would I get a graph like this, or would I get a different kind of graph? Okay. That's very good. That will be recorded in the video, because how important it was. <laughs> So, so the question to ask is, if I pick out 50 iron clusters from a random solid solution, will I get a graph like this? Okay. And you might remember in statistics, there's a thing known as a binomial distribution. That if I pick out a certain number of atoms, I ought to get a certain distribution of compositions. And here is a comparison between the experimental results, which are in black, and a binomial distribution for 50 iron groups. And you can see that really they are not very different. Okay. You can see for the three different elements, iron, chromium, and aluminium. They're not different, which means that yes, I have truly achieved a solid solution. So remember, from a thermodynamic point of view, the meaning of a homogeneous solution is that you have a random distribution of atoms. It doesn't mean that if I pick out 10 atoms, I will get exactly the same composition as 50 atoms. Yeah. You can actually prove it statistically. Yeah, or exactly. Just, or just visually. Uh, sorry? Did you, did you prove it statistically yeah, or yeah. just by looking at it? Oh, no, no. I mean, when you look at distributions, you can do certain tests, sure, sure. depending on how many measurements you've done mm -hmm. and so on. And then you can say, within this limits of confidence, Yes, this is a random solid solution. Okay. Now, it's very interesting because this, this is an iron, chromium, aluminium atom. And we've achieved a random solution, even though iron and chromium hate each other. That means if you gave this material a chance, the iron atoms would cluster and the chromium atoms would cluster. And this is because we force them together. Yeah, we force them together by mechanical element. There's nowhere near equilibrium. Right, so that's basically the mechanical alloying process. And if you want it, you could buy this material commercially. It's very expensive, but really, I mean, it depends on what application you want. If you want to make a cube out of this, that it will operate at 1400 degrees centigrade, you have no choice. There's no material other than a ceramic, which would survive there, and a ceramic would break very easily. Whereas this is a metal, and metals have ductility, and the yttrium oxide particles ensure that it has strength at that temperature. Okay, so let's proceed and analyze this process using only the information that you've learned, okay? 
And you see that there are some spectacular results that come out of it, which are quite breathtaking. So first we start with these large lumps, you know, the powders, the elemental powders of iron and so forth. And of course they have very large numbers of atoms, so we can basically uh, treat them like a mechanical mixture. And the free energy of the mechanical mixture is simply the weighted average of the free energies of the pure components here, weighted according to the mole fractions of A and B. And we also know that when we form an intimate solution like this, even if there is no change in the binding energies, you get a reduction in free energy because of entropy of mixing. That's right. So this is entirely due to the entropy of mixing. In other words, it's minus T delta S. Of course, we can take account of enthalpies, as we did in the last lecture, but let's for the moment assume that the enthalpy of mixing is zero. Now, the problem is that this process is not properly described by the two slides that I've just shown you. Okay, so we started off with large lumps, and we ended up with an atomic solution. And that's all you will find in any textbook. You will not find what really happens in mechanical alloy, and that is that you take large lumps, you put them together, weld them together, you break them on into ever smaller lumps until you get to this stage. In other words, there is no theory for going from here to here. No, no description in any textbook about how you go from here to here. They simply deal with the initial state and the final state. And we're going to derive that. And remember, we are assuming for the moment that the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So have you got any idea on how I can treat this problem? How can I discover the free energy change on going from this to this, as opposed to this to this? You know how to go from here to here, right? How did we work out the enthalpy of mixing? The number of states. Yeah, so we calculated the total number of arrangements here. What's to stop you from calculating the total number of arrangements here? Or here? And so on. I mean, it will be a fewer number of arrangements, but there's no problem. We could still work out, you know, we know how many particles there are, and therefore we could work out how many possible arrangements there are, right? Exactly right. So let's do that. This is what we did in the last lecture, where we worked out, supposing we have capital N lattice sites and small n A atoms, then the first atom can be placed in capital N positions, the second one in N minus one, and so forth, and therefore we derive that there are that many different arrangements possible when I put uh, small n A atoms on a lattice with capital N sites. All we have to do is replace the word atom by the word particle, and the particle can be of any size. It can contain any number of atoms. So this is exactly that equation, but M here represents the number of atoms in an A particle, and that represents the number of atoms in a B particle. Okay? But otherwise, the derivation of this equation is exactly the same as the previous equation. If I, if I make M A and M B equal to 1, this becomes exactly the equation we had earlier. Okay, so now how do I go about working out the entropy of mixing? got the number of arrangements, how do I work out the entropy of mixing? Boltzmann. Boltzmann equation. Yeah, that we have change in entropy uh, will be when we take the difference between our final number of arrangements when we have small particles and the single arrangement when we had these two large lumps of A and B. And that multiply by K and that gives us the configuration entropy change when we go from very large particles to slightly smaller particles.
And the equation for the entropy of mixing looks a bit more complicated, simply because we now have particle sizes in there. But again, if you set the particle size here to be one atom, then you will recover this equation which we had in the last lecture. So there's nothing complicated in this. It's simply taking the logarithm of the number of arrangements here, oops, number of arrangements, using Stirling's approximation, yeah, that log of y factorial equals y log y minus y. Using Stirling's approximation, you get this equation. And in this equation, if you set the value of all the m's equal to one, one atom, that becomes exactly the equation you find in all the textbooks. So this entropy of mixing will be a smaller quantity when we have large particles because the number of arrangements we have is smaller. So then the question arises, you know, at what point does a mixture of particles start to behave like a solution? Yeah? In other words, at what point do the particles feel each other's presence? Okay, now we have to make an arbitrary judgment here. And I've decided that when the free energy of mixing is about 10 joules per mole, we can say it's a solution because a lot of phase changes happen at a driving force which is as small as 10 joules per mole. Now you could decide it's 100 joules per mole, it doesn't really matter. It allows you to say that, look, I, I, the configuration entropy of mixing is becoming important according to your definition of importance when the particle size becomes about a thousand atoms. Now of course you know that there's this subject called nanomaterials and so forth. Yeah, where they're looking at tiny particles. But those people haven't actually thought about this entropy of mixing. Yeah. And you know, there's another parallel course going in the department. Do, are you friendly with any of those people? You can teach them about thermodynamics of nanomaterials. Okay? So, the first thing we conclude is that we really can treat these as large lumps of material until we get to a particle size of the order of a thousand atoms, after which we should start treating it more as a solution. All this we've achieved simply considering the configurational entropy of mixing. We now need to think about enthalpies of mixing because as I said last time, there is no system which has a zero enthalpy of mixing in reality. Can I just ask, how, how crucial is your choice of threshold, say, you say, 10 kilojoules? Yeah. 10 joules, you say. Mm -hmm. 10 joules per mole. How crucial is that choice? But I mean, it really depends. So it really depends on your problem. Yeah? So if, if I'm thinking in terms of how much surface I have per unit volume, okay, if I calculate that and multiply by the amount of interface energy per unit area, it's much, much larger than 10 joules per mole, then that's not a good choice. So it depends on what problem you are trying to address as to where you start treating this as a solution as opposed to a mechanical mixture. Presumably you could relate it also to the energy of interaction between the actual... That's the next bit. That's the next bit. So now we are going to remove the assumption that the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So you notice we haven't used any new concepts so far, but we've still got a very useful result. Now, for an atomic solution, this is the enthalpy of mixing we derived in the last lecture, and I hope you went through the calculation okay, to actually get to the stage from the number of AA bonds, the number of BB bonds, and AB bonds. And I have given that to you, I think, in your notes, but it's useful to actually go through it. Where this is Avogadro's number, this is the coordination number, the concentration of A, the concentration of B, and the difference between uh, these binding energies. Okay. So AA plus BB less 2AB. Now we can't use that equation because we only have bonds at interfaces between particles. It's no longer an atomic solution. Yeah. All the A atoms in this region have no bonds with the B atoms. Yeah. It's only those atoms at the interface which see the presence of the B atoms. Yeah. Is, are you happy with that? So what, what, what can we do? Well, we've got to scale this 
by the amount of surface we have in a volume of material. It's only a thin layer here, an atomic layer here, which feels the presence of other species of atoms. Yes? Now, what do you think? Does the amount of surface per unit volume increase when my particle size decreases? Or does the amount of surface per unit volume? And the convention is surface per unit volume is written like this. Does that increase or decrease as particle size is reduced? Well, I mean, I can go back to this diagram. What do you think? The amount of surface, is it increased relative to this? Yeah, so as you make this finer and finer, you will get more and more surface. And remember, a surface is a defect, because the atoms don't know whether they belong to this crystal structure or this crystal structure. And if you, if you hold this at a high temperature for a very long time, all the surfaces will disappear. It will tend to become a single crystal. Okay? Just like if you take soap froth, the bubbles will coarsen with time, because the surface energy is, is being reduced. So that is a structural component of free energy. Yeah, so what we have to do is we have to calculate the amount of surface we have per unit volume. There's absolutely no need for you to think about the detail here. Basically, the amount of surface per unit volume is proportional to 1 upon the particle size. Particle size. This is just pure geometry here. Particles become smaller, the amount of surface increases. And of course, when this becomes zero, it becomes infinite. We're not ever going to get to a zero particle size, we've got atoms. And we have already got our enthalpy of mixing, because all we have to do is scale this, multiply this by S3, and we have the contribution due to the bond energies at the interface. But we have to take account of the structural component of free energy, which is because the atoms are not in their perfect positions for one crystal or the other crystal. So if we take the surface energy per unit area, sigma is the surface energy per unit area, unit area and we multiply it by the amount of surface we have per unit volume then that gives us the enthalpy due to the defect so this is an additional term which we must include because we don't have an atomic solution <coughs> happy with that? that sigma is the energy per unit area and this is the total amount of area I have per unit volume so if I multiply that then I get joules per meter cube and this is simply the molar volume because I want to convert joules per meter cube into joules per mole now unfortunately this gives us a result which contradicts our earlier experimental result that we have really formed a solid solution. Because the amount of surface we have per unit volume increases as the particle size decreases, indefinitely. And this is always a positive term, because sigma is positive, the surface energy is positive. It opposes the formation of a solution by this process. And this term will become overwhelming, doesn't matter what the entropy of mixing is. We are creating defect as we make the particles grow smaller and smaller. And what this says is that it is impossible to form a solution. So there's something wrong with our theory. We, I showed you experimentally, we find that we have a perfect random solid solution on an atomic scale. What this is saying is that whatever you do, as the particles get smaller, the defect density becomes so large 
the amount of surface per unit volume, that there's no way that solution formation is favored. Now, are you familiar with precipitation? That you have a matrix and you form a tiny precipitate. It starts off as a coherent particle. Okay. Stop me if you don't understand anything. You know, it, it forms as a particle which matches the structure of the parent. Then the particle grows and it breaks coherency and becomes incoherent. Right. Are you familiar with that? Yes or no? No, good. So I will show you a slide for that. <laughs> Watch this. So imagine that this is a precipitate which is forming inside this matrix. And these are lattice planes which are going through the particle. When the particle is small and its crystal structure is different, so the spacing of the planes is different inside the particle, these planes can remain continuous through the particle. And that's what we call coherent. These planes of atoms are continuous. Even though they are distorted, they are continuous across the boundary between the particle and the matrix. So that's called coherent. Now, as the particle grows larger, it can still remain coherent, but notice that you know the distortions are becoming larger and larger. Because here we have a different interplanar spacing, and here you don't. This distortion has become much larger than over here. Can you see that? So eventually what happens is that you can't tolerate a large distortion, and you break the continuity of planes. Yeah, so this plane, for example, no longer continues through the particle. And this is what we call a dislocation. Yeah, are you familiar with the concept of a dislocation? If you are not, it doesn't matter. It's simply that this plane ends at this point. And this is called an incoherent particle. And this has a larger energy, energy per unit area, than a situation like this where it's coherent. Yeah? So this is what happens in precipitation, that a small particle starts off as a coherent particle, but as it grows, the strains become larger and larger, and coherency breaks down. Now, what is the relevance of this to our problem? We are not pre actually precipitating anything. Well, the relevance is that we need to think in the opposite direction. Yeah, we, we're going to start with large particles, which are incoherent, and break them down into smaller and smaller particles and what will happen is that they will gain coherency. So you are decreasing the value of sigma as the particle becomes smaller and smaller. Until eventually the boundary completely disappears because you have atoms and you don't have a boundary around an atom, do you? When the particle size becomes a single atom, the boundary simply disappears, becomes part of the crystal structure. So, in mechanical alloying, what's happening is that you're doing the opposite of precipitation. You're starting with large particles, breaking them down into particles which are small enough so that you gain coherency and eventually sigma becomes zero. When that happens, of course, our original theory is wrong that this increases indefinitely. If sigma decreases as the particle size decreases, then all is well. And that is, in fact, what happens. Okay, so if I, if I plot now the free energy of mixing, taking into account the fact that sigma is decreasing as I make my particles more coherent, then I find, okay, so this is the free energy of mixing, and this is zero here. And this is the size of the particle, number of atoms. Okay. As I decrease the particle size, at first, I get an increase in free energy because I'm creating more surface and I still haven't become coherent. It's only when coherency starts to kick in that I start to get a decrease, and then of course the entropy of mixing comes in as well. And therefore, I get this sharp decrease in free energy. And this is concentration here. Notice that the rate at which free energy decreases is larger when I have 0.5, because you remember that at a more fraction of 0.5, the configurational entropy of mixing is maximum. Yeah, that's why we have that curve which has a minimum at 0.5, right? 
Now, what we predicted then is something very fundamental, which was never known before, and that is that there is a barrier to the formation of a solution by this mechanical alloying process. And the height of that barrier depends on how we gain uh, coherency as the particle size becomes smaller.